Hi, this is Ben Finio, and this video will show how I built this understairs Elsa ice castle for my daughter, complete with color changing LED lighting. So, the inspiration for this project came from my wife, who saw all these fantastic under the stairs playhouses people have built and shown on the internet. And we have an empty space under our steps in the basement, so she asked if I could do something like this. And my answer was no, there is no way I can build anything that nice, but I can put up a couple pieces of plywood and make a fort or something. So initially we thought about doing kind of a regular castle or maybe basic house, but like many three-year-olds across the country, our daughter is currently obsessed with Frozen. We actually haven't even seen the second movie yet, but that doesn't really matter. So we decided to go with an Elsa's ice castle under the steps. So the inspiration for this came primarily from the iconic Let It Go scene in the first movie where Elsa constructs her magical ice castle. For copyright reasons, I didn't want to risk showing that in this video, but for those of you who haven't already seen it a thousand times with your kids, I have a link to that video in the description. Another good place to get inspiration was just searching DIY Elsa Ice Castle online. Tons of people have done very nice paper craft or larger cardboard ones like this or various tent fort kind of things. So I kind of started looking at these just to get an idea for the general look and feel of what a craft design would look like and decided I wanted to try and keep the pointy or angular design of the actual castle from the movie while obviously keeping it safe for small children, but also ideally maintaining some of the kind of graceful curving spirally stuff that Elsa does when she's doing her ice magic. So here's a screenshot of the actual castle from the movie in case you didn't remember that. So I started just sketching some designs in PowerPoint, no fancy CAD program required. This made it easy to play with the colors and different shapes. And there's a stick figure of my daughter to scale for the approximate height. So based on the shape of what we have in our basement, I was gonna have room for two walls, one of which I decided would have just windows on it. The other one would have the door. And then we want some sort of pointy spires on the top. And again, in PowerPoint, I just kind of cycled through different iterations of what this can look like before deciding what to build. So from there, I came up with the actual dimensions for what I would need to build to fit in the spot in our basement. If you click the link to the Instructable in the description of this video, this file is downloadable, so you can use this as a template, but obviously you will need to measure the space under your stairs and possibly adjust this to make sure it fits. So with that, let's get building. I don't have a table saw or a pickup truck, which can make purchasing and cutting 4x8 sheets of plywood kind of annoying. You can get 4x8 sheets cut on a big panel saw at Lowe's and Home Depot, but I wasn't sure exactly what dimensions I was going to need. They also charge a lot to deliver. I found a local lumber yard that'll deliver for only 15 bucks, so I got the 4x8 sheets delivered to me, and then recruited a little help from my wife to hold the big sheets for the initial cut with my circular saw and guide until I could get these into slightly smaller, more manageable pieces. And then some of the smaller cuts I was able to just do myself. So this is me marking out everything on one of the large side walls, including the windows and the battlements or crenellations or whatever the thingies at the top are called. I use the circular saw for straight cuts. For example, here I am using it to cut the wedges out of the top edge of the wall. That doesn't always give you a vertical edge when you have an inside corner where two different cuts meet, so I use the jigsaw to come in and clean those up when needed. For the windows, I pre-drilled holes on the inside of the corners and then used a jigsaw to cut them out. It was a little difficult to reach the inner window on the largest wall, and this is how I found out that I do not fit through the windows. But thankfully it turned out that I could just reach it from the outside. Now, I knew I would be putting this flush up against the wall so the base molding would get in the way. I used a scrap piece of that to trace an outline and then used the jigsaw to cut it out so the rest of the piece would fit flush up against the wall. The process for the smaller wall was largely the same. This one was just a lot easier to reach since it isn't as big. Now, if you follow my design, you have to be careful when cutting out the door. There is a very narrow spot in this wall that allows it to start to flex and sag once you've cut out the door piece. So this is where having a second person to help hold things or some more saw horses would be handy, but I had to work with what I had available. But once I had that cut out, I removed the door piece so I can paint that separately. Now, after finishing the walls, I cut out smaller strips for all the spires. This is where having a table saw would make life easier since they're all the same width, but again, I made do with the circular saw on the guide. 
So after I had all the pieces cut out, I wanted to see how this all looked. I had it sketched on paper, but I really had no idea what it would actually look like full scale. So I didn't want to go ahead and start screwing things together until I really thought that I liked the spires and the size of the doors and the windows and everything. So I just did a dry fit with clamps. I had enough clamps to clamp the entire structure together and use a couple angle brackets to hold the corners of the walls together, which allowed me to do a temporary fit to make sure I liked how everything looked decided it would be okay, and then pre-drilled holes to attach the spires so I could attach them with screws later after I was done sanding. To get the spires lined up properly and make sure everything was square, I laid the whole thing flat. This is much easier than trying to work with it all vertical up in the air and using the clamps. This allowed me to measure exactly, get everything aligned, pre-drill holes so the spires would be in place properly, and then when I go to assemble it vertically again, those pre-drilled holes will line up with the screws, and I won't have to bother trying to measure and realign while it's all up in the air. I went through the same process for the smaller wall. Again, here I am using the clamps to attach the spires to make sure I like the size and the height. And again, I did a test fit of the entire thing, connecting the three walls together. Apparently, I forgot to take good footage of this part but here I am attaching those angle brackets to the inside corners. Again, pre-drilling these holes so these can be easily removed later when I need to disassemble the walls to carry the whole thing into the house. So it looks like I lied a little bit earlier. I did lay this flat again to screw the spires on, but I did want these to be removable just in case it was too heavy or I had trouble fitting it through a door, so I didn't use any wood glue. These are just screwed on. In order to make sure the door was square, I laid everything down and pre-drilled holes for the hinges and attached those while it was flat. And then I stood it up and pre-drilled a hole for the cabinet doorknob I bought. I got a faceted acrylic doorknob at Lowe's because I figured that kind of matched the ice castle look. Again, I had to be careful here because of the design. There is a lot of flex in this wall since the two sides are only connected by a narrow section at the top, so the door is a little wobbly. Ideally, that'll be better once I anchor it to the wall in the basement. Next, I attached a magnetic cabinet latch to the inside of the door frame using a piece of scrap wood. This is to prevent the door from opening inward and to keep it latched and prevent it from swinging open. Once I had the hardware attached, I did a quick test to make sure the door opened and latched shut. My wife kindly pointed out that I was a moron and that you can't pull the door closed from the inside because there's no handle, so I bought a door pull to attach there later. Next, sanding. So much sanding. I hand sanded all of the edges to get rid of splinters and sharp corners. I used a finished sander on all of the flat surfaces to prepare for painting. I didn't really film this part because I didn't want to get dust all over my camera. And I was also lucky because this was actually before the COVID-19 pandemic, so I still had dust masks. I don't have a good dust removal system, so if I had tried to do this during the pandemic, I guess I would have just inhaled a lot of sawdust. Now I was done cutting and sanding, it was time to get ready for painting. Originally I had considered laying everything flat and doing it one side at a time, but I decided that would take way too long. I was sort of running on out of time as my daughter's birthday was approaching. So luckily I had plenty of scrap wood handy, so I just used that to prop everything up off the garage floor so I could just paint everything while it was vertical and still get the bottom edges. For paint, I did one layer of primer and then two layers of high gloss light blue paint, everything with a brush. This was a little annoying because I was doing it in my garage in Ithaca, New York in late February and early March. If you know anything about upstate New York, it is kind of cold here in winter, so sometimes it got down to around 40 degrees in the garage. I was able to run a space heater to get it a little closer up to 50, which was the minimum recommended temperature for the paint. But luckily everything still did dry okay and I didn't have any issues with flaking or the paint not drying or anything. I guess you can also tell from my hair that I clearly hadn't showered before this part, but why shower when you're probably going to get paint all over yourself anyway? All right, now to try getting creative. As anyone who knows me will tell you, my artistic ability probably plateaued in third grade, and while I can handle 90 degree angles and maybe some of the more acute angles in this design, freehanding curves is not really my thing, but I wanted to attempt to draw some of the spirally ice magic that Elsa does in the Let It Go scene in the first movie. So to play things safe, I tested these on the inside walls first, since while kids will be able to see those when they're playing inside, they won't really be visible to adults or visitors on the outside of the castle. So if they are hideous, I wanted to test them out here first and then change my plan if it didn't work out. 
but luckily they turned out okay. So I just kind of freehanded these spirally looking things, one between each window, and after practicing a few of them on the inside, I went to do them on the outside. One thing that didn't work very well here was mixing a glitter additive into the paint. We wanted these to be sparkly. I bought some glitter additive that recommended using a roller, but I couldn't really use a roller to do these, so it didn't really work at all with a brush. And I did try it later on the snowflake you'll see on the door and with some of the blue paint on the spires, but that only really worked when the light hits it at exactly the right angle. It doesn't kind of create an omnidirectional glitter or sparkle. So I have a link to it in the Instructable. Maybe you'll have better luck with it than I did, or you can try a different type of glitter paint. But everything really wound up just kind of having a, a glossy, regular paint look with no glitter. And of course, the downside here, even when I do shower, is you can see my bald spot when the camera's behind me like this. So I guess I just can't win. So after I was satisfied with the look of the spirals, I finished painting those on the outside and carried the whole thing into the basement. It was just barely small enough to fit through a door with the tallest spiral there, but definitely, uh, preferably a two-person job if you have someone to help. So I anchored everything to the walls because I correctly predicted that my daughter would immediately try to climb through the windows. And even though it's very heavy on its own, I didn't want to risk it falling over. I also had to do a couple trips back and forth to sand or cut down the door. Since I was installing this on carpet, it was dragging a little bit and I hadn't shaved enough off the bottom to begin with. The wall you see on the left there also twisted slightly when I anchored everything to the walls of the house, which was making the door jam when it closed. So I had to sand down and repaint a little bit of that edge. So that's something to think about. Maybe you'll want to carry the whole thing inside and test the door before painting. It depends on how much of a pain that is. In my case, I didn't feel like schlepping it down to the basement and then back to the garage. So I painted it first, but kind of wound up regretting it later. So after that, I installed the LED light strips along the top edge of the inside, which I didn't film myself doing that part, but they came with this little remote control that allows you to change the colors, which as fans of the original movie will know, is very important because when Elsa gets upset, her magic turns kind of a reddish magenta color. So if you are role-playing from the movie, which my daughter loves to do and she always makes me be Anna, it's very important to let you change the colors of the magic depending on Elsa's mood. So I hope that was helpful and kind of provides an inspiration for what you could build if you have a similar space under your stairs. Again, there is a link to the project on Instructables in the description below the video. That has the actual materials list and dimensional drawings and everything, so you will probably need to modify those based on the dimensions of the space under your stairs, but it should give you a good starting point. If you have a question, feel free to leave a comment here on YouTube or in the Instructable. Thanks.